Good day and welcome to the 10th anniversary episode of CDI Talks. My name is Anton Shekhovtsov and I chair the Center for Democratic Integrity, an Austria-based organization monitoring authoritarian influences in Europe. Today I'm talking to Marie Mendras, a French political scientist specializing in Russian studies and international relations. Dr. Mendras is a professor at the Paris School of International Affairs of Sciences Po, a research fellow at the National Center for Scientific Research and a member of the editorial board of the French humanities journal Esprit. She has published extensively, both in English and in Russian, on Russia-West relations, as well as on the Russian political system, elite behavior, elections and society. Marie also provides expertise to the European institutions and think tanks, and has served as a consultant for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Defense. I hope you will enjoy our conversation with Marie. Do like this video and subscribe to our channel not to miss future editions of CDI Talks. Marie, thank you so much for, for this conversation. Um, my, que my first question would be around, uh, about the sanctions. You know, we are, it's the seventh year now uh, after the annexation of Crimea, after the conflict in eastern Ukraine with participation of Russia. The EU, uh, the EU sanctions imposed on Russia because of its uh, behavior in, in Ukraine for seven years are there. Nobody is going to lift them anytime soon. I think that not only Putin's regime, but also some officials in EU member states thought that the sanctions would fall at some point. But this is not happening. Was, there, was it a mistake on, on the part of Putin's Russia to think that the EU is so weak and it would lift the sanctions and everything would go back to normal? Sanctions against uh, the Russian ruling elites uh, uh, are not only coming from the EU. What was extraordinary about the spring and summer of 2014 were that all democratic countries voted sanctions. The United States, Canada, Australia, Japan, um, you name it. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, European Union at the time, 28 countries with Great Britain. Uh, so there is nothing uh, specific to uh, the EU, uh, even if <laughs> Russian official media uh, always present the EU as, uh, as weak. And I hope we have time for me to explain why I think, on the contrary, the EU is uh, strong. Uh, your question about Putin's surprise, yes, Vladimir Vladimirovich did not anticipate any of this. Um, which uh, shows that there was no big plan about Ukraine. I think uh, the Russian rulers have been, uh, you know, waiting for next day's event uh, to make a decision about uh, what to do to exfiltrate Yanukovych or to fight to keep him in power in Kiev. Then, you know, they had the, the Crimea plan that was certainly in one of the drawers for many years, but then they decided to go, as you remember, during the Olympics in Sochi. I mean, that was something completely sensational. Mm. And, and then they went further, but I, I, I don't think it was anticipated by the military even, which was uh, the uh, intervention in eastern Donbass. Uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, there was this misunderstanding on the part of Putin's regime about, uh, about the structures, about the institutions of the EU. Uh, because probably you would agree that in Russia itself, uh, all, all state institutions, they are sort of fake, they are not real institutions, while at the same time in the EU it may be very, very slow, but it's actually, it has a working institution, so there was no uh, such uh, anticipation. What do you think about this, you know, um, uh, confusion on, on, the, on the part of Putin's regime about the EU's institutions, and why do you think it's actually quite strong in, in contrast to what, what, what the Kremlin thinks of the EU? Yeah. I, I don't think Putin and his men compare uh, their own country to the EU institution and the EU space and community. Um, I, I would say that in, in Putin's Russia, institutions are not fake. 
but they are hollowed out by you know the regime and they are more than decorative in the sense that they make it possible for them to hide the real ruling mechanisms which all happen outside the government outside parliament outside trade unions etc so this is a, a, a a big subject in itself is how um, uh, this um, complete destruction of public space, public institutions, and recent, in, in inverted commas, elections in uh, September have demonstrated, you know, that even universal suffrage now and representation of citizens is dead. Uh, and uh, we also know that that might backfire on Putin's capacity to stay in power outside a public institution with corruption and uh, enforced repression, right? So the question about the EU is very interesting. Um, in fact, even our friends and I ally, the Americans, have often um, spoke, uh, spoken of the European Union as a weak, non-fully sovereign institution, weak power, they don't want to have an army, they, yeah. and they've always made this mistake, uh, and even uh, I, as, as a French scholar, often in, in Washington, in New York, and uh, could not convince my excellent colleagues that yes, the European Union is a strong uh, institution. Uh, about sanction, it's very simple. If um, um, the EU uh, didn't exist and each European government in 2014 had had to um, engage a discussion in Parliament and a vote and go for targeted sanctions, it would have taken ages. And in probably a good half of the countries, no sanction would have been agreed by parliament and then the, and it's very difficult in a country like France or Germany to go for what you'd call in America executive orders where the executive can go for that kind of uh, decision. With the EU it is much uh, uh, simpler. Uh, it, it is a collective of 28 governments at the time uh, where you have a uh, working institutions, parliament, commissioned, special um, um, offices and, and delegations, and the Council of Ministers, uh, where all countries make political decision on the basis of what the parliament and the commission uh, uh, give them. As, um, yeah, and, and this is often overlooked, the amount of work that the Commission and the Parliament do in research, analysis, uh, proposals, etc. Now, you have the 28 heads, heads of government or and heads of state in meeting in this uh, beautiful room uh, and um, having to decide what do we do about Putin invading parts of Ukraine and then um, giving the uh, so-called separatists uh, direct military help and a book missile and they probably make a mistake and down a civilian plane, the Malaysian airline, mid-July 2014. And can you imagine one of the 28 saying, I am against sanctioning the Russian state and Putin's regime for that. Uh, and then when in the summer of 2014, you have 10,000 dead in Eastern Donbass and Putin continues to deny that those are Russian men um, and Russian tanks and Russian missiles based in Eastern Donbass. Um, how would you want even <laughs> Viktor Orban or, 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 to, to say, no, we, we, we defend those? And it's very comfortable 
for the 28 governments because when they go home they do not have to bear the full responsibility for the decision to go for targeted sanctions against the Russian rulers. Uh, hence, there is not even a debate inside society uh, about whether or not we should uh, punish um, the decision makers that went for war. Uh, you know, we, we, it, it, it's just a given. So this is the very strength of the European Union, is that the Union can make decisions that nobody will question afterwards, or just a few exceptions. You know, but it, it's really the exception to the rule. I cannot agree more here. Uh, I would only add that probably it's also simpler or easier for the EU to impose sanctions in contrast to uh, individual countries is because the EU uh, or capitals or you know officials uh, who gather to discuss these questions, they can also make a reference to European values enshrined in the uh, official documents of the EU. They can say we are defending European values because nobody can say that right now. We are defending Hungarian values by sanctioning Russia or we are defending French values because then it would be very, very strange. It would sound very strange. But this reference to the European values is something very different. I think more importantly, uh, it is the question of principles and law. The, the concept of values has been so used and overused and misused by the non-democrats um, and especially in uh, Russia or Belarus that I prefer um, the use of the terms of principles, fundamental rights uh, and uh, rule of law uh, because this is very concrete. It is easy to say when it's good or not, who is abiding by the rules and the principles or not. Values is a notion that can be interpreted in you know any form and this is why also in our defense of the rule of law and fundamental rights uh, in Russia, Belarus and other non-democratic societies. I think it is always more efficient to speak of rule of law, um, lack of justice, um, lack of uh, alternance in power, than democracy. Because as you well know, um, uh, every autocrat loves to talk about uh, democracy even the, the Chinese leader. Uh, so um, values could be in the way of a true and transparent debate, especially with our societies in Europe, when precisely uh, the term democracy is being questioned because there's no definition. Uh, it, it, each one of us has his own personal definition of, of um, democracy, whereas if you take France now entering a period of presidential campaign, uh, nobody is going to question the rule of law. Nobody is going to question the independence of judges in France. Uh, nobody uh, is going to ask uh, for a dramatic change in French security policies, etc. Um, so we feel very safe during this campaign that um, whoever is elected will not turn his or her back on the rule of law and the republic. Now, the problem of how democratic institutions uh, function. That's another story, and this is why you know we have to <laughs> to 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 be extremely attentive uh, at how the political debate uh, is, is going to uh, unfold uh, in France. But I think also with the EU, uh, in addition 
to these rule of law and international norms and, and well, law as such, there is also like non-material aspects about the sanctions, about, you know, being together. It's solidarity. Sure. Because it's, it really, I think it's, uh, probably solidarity is not enshrined in any law, but still every member state, I think, even if they are governed uh, by people who are more or less friendly towards Putin and Russia, Mm-hmm. It's still very, very difficult for them to go against this solidarity. Uh, absolutely. Um, it, but it's not only solidarity, because you do have, at times, solidarity between democracies. For example, uh, in 2014, all democracies um, were together criticizing uh, Putin's decision, but also uh, putting him aside and remember um, he you know he had to quit the G8 immediately and a number of other institutions he was not invited to any bilateral meeting or EU uh, uh, meeting uh, during at least two or three years so yes there was a very strong political Uh, solidarity amongst all democracies that the man had become a threat to European security and to just the the general uh, um, functioning of um, uh, of world relations uh, and also the respect for sovereign state the respect for the UN Charter etc etc yes solidarity but Europe is special because it is also a space, um, a very um, um, dense space uh, with uh, a population, uh, with uh, a territory that makes sense. And that can be extended because it makes sense to, in my view at least, it makes sense to be able to uh, welcome uh, more rule of law countries that are neighbors, east or south. Because this is why uh, the uh, European community in the 1950s was created. It was to defend peace, democracy, prosperity in a shattered uh, post-war Europe. Let's remember, it was not only NATO, it was um, uh, the European uh, Community first, then became the European uh, uh, Union. So every time there are, of course, hot controversies uh, about, you know, should we take in uh, the United Kingdom in the early 1970s, or should we take in Greece or maybe tomorrow Turkey uh, when Turkey becomes um, a better governed uh, country and uh, because to join the EU is not only to get bonuses (laughs) it is it is really to be able to abide by very strict rules uh, and this is why it's working, is that people live together. The Schengen space, you know, we live in one space with the other Schengen uh, population. And it has worked during the COVID pandemic and it continues to work. Uh, how many, you know, in, in Russia, in America, in elsewhere said, ha, huh, the EU with its uh, 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 Schengen, it, it, it's it's going to you know completely disintegrate with the problem of uh, of the pandemic, and it did not you know so um, it, it I think it's much more than like-minded countries, which is the motto in in America now after the four uh, years of Trump. Uh, the like-minded countries will never be. Um, an institution, a community like uh, the EU. 
There are fears in some uh, European capitals that cutting down on communication with Russia would uh, lead to Russia becoming more, probably even aggressive, uh, bolder, uh, would be more isolated, and because of this, you know, may may pose even a bigger threat uh, to its neighbors and also to uh, uh, to probably even EU countries. At the same time, uh, the most recent report uh, of the European Parliament on strategic uh, relations with Russia, uh, for example, said that uh, uh, the EU should be ready not to recognize the uh, so-called elections in Russia parliamentary elections if they are not fair, if they are not democratic, if they violate the international norms. In one of your most recent articles, you gave plenty of evidence mm. that actually it was the case that Russian elections were not democratic. They did not, uh, they, they violated uh, many... They were not they were, elections. They were not elections, were not elections from, elections. The, from, from yeah. the very start. Yeah. So, imagine the EU does not recognize these elections as, as fair. Um, so, that would be cutting down on communication with Russia. Can there be a balance? Because some would believe we still need to talk to Russia you know, for it not become so isolated. Where is the balance here? Can actually there be a balance in these you know, ever-changing situation? Well, my response is very simple. Russia is not Vladimir Putin and the groups around him. So we have to stop saying Russia. The Russians have absolutely no um, possibility, no capacity to tell their uh, deputies or their executive uh, powers, administrations, what they would like and what they don't like in what they do. They feel misgoverned in the great majority of them. There is absolutely no doubt about them. In the non-elections of September, um, all the good independent experts and observers came to the conclusion that at the most of the 109 million um, voters in the Russian Federation, at the most, 15 million of them voted freely or under pressure for Putin's uh, uh, governing party, United Russia, because also you know uh, um, a turnout was uh, was law, and all the numbers that we got from the electoral commission, uh, from uh, uh, the government, were manipulated uh, results. So this is very important, as it is very important to um, remember that to this day in Belarus, more than a year after uh, Lukashenko decided to stay in power with the use of force, totally illegally, because he the election was not an election, and he certainly was not uh, elected because the majority of votes went to Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya, who is now the re representative of democratic Belarus uh, in Europe, in, uh, in Vilnius. But she's the international representative of democratic Belarus. Well, listen to all Belarusians, whether people you talk to in the street, for those who can all still go and, 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 and talk to people in the street in Belarus, and talk to uh, Svetlana, who came to Paris in September and was very frank about it, or any uh, militant or engaged citizen of Belarus today, they will all say, please go for sanctions. Sanctions are not against us. You know, what we have to suffer under Lukashenko's repressive regime uh, is much worse than any economic sanction. You have to go for sanctions because they are working. They show that you are behind us. They show that you don't recognize him as president of Belarus. 
And by saying that the regime is illegal, you are also helping us saying that it is completely illegitimate. And this is, you know, what I mean about Putin's regime, is that by playing with universal suffrage, as if, you know, he were betting at a casino, and trying to impose a set results with almost unanimous uh, uh, result in many provinces in the Federation of Russia. Uh, Putin is actually betting his legitimacy. Because a few years ago, when I was writing the very same article that I wrote in September about the fact that elections were manipulated and results should not be quoted by us and should not be taken seriously. I've been writing this for 20 years. Now people actually notice, but it is the first time that uh, uh, my work, the evidence that I produce, the analysis I produce, because I've been an observer uh, at elections in Russia many, many times in the last uh, uh, 30 years. Well, people trust that maybe my analysis is honest and, 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 and correct. So, what we are now facing is a change of mood and attitude in all European countries. You won't find a member of government um, who will talk positively about the way that Russia is ruled, about economic prospects for Russia, or about the fact that Russia is a good and safe neighbor for us in Europe. The problem is exactly what you mentioned, that is how do we reach um, another stage in our relationship with the Kremlin, not with the Russians. We have no problem with the Russians, I don't think. Uh, as, you know, the big events of 89, 90, showed, you know, they, uh, I, I don't think the average Russian, when he's freed of uh, the Putin grip and the, the Putin propaganda on television and, and everywhere, the average Russian will very soon forget about Putin <laughs> and his very special brand of uh, uh, hysteric nationalism, which is really just a mode of survival to stay in power in, in, indefinitely. Uh, so our relationship is focused on the relationship with the one and only who can talk to us and make decisions. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Even if you talk to Mr. Lavrov, Minister of Foreign Affairs, I don't think any of us really knows who is the Prime Minister. We always have to check, you know, how to actually spell it. Um, and this is the problem with, you know, authoritarian, personalized, corrupt governments is that you only have this one man at the top who's been in power for almost 22 years now. And as uh, Mrs. Merkel said uh, uh, in quite <laughs> nicely a few years ago, he seems to have lost some sense of reality, which I think is the best summary ever uh, we had uh, of, uh, of the situation of an aging uh, of an aging leader. And this is where I believe that the only way to have a rather constructive exchange with this man is to speak in one voice, to stop trying to play the bilateral relationship like Emmanuel Macron has been doing um, in the first years of his presidency and I could quote others uh, who have been trying to do the same. Um, and um, Angela Merkel was not doing that. 
but she also was under the pressure of her own uh, uh, political class and most importantly the business uh, you know, uh, I business and lobby stream two here and of course not stream two is I think the um, just the, the true example uh, of what our problem is is because we are democracies uh, everything needs to be discussed to be uh, accepted and politicians even in democracies you know they want to stay in power and there's only so much they can do uh, to process the pressure coming from financial industrial uh, lobbies and this is interesting because it is even more of an issue it's even more of an issue compared to political or economic programs and, uh, but that I think would be probably for uh, longer conversations. Now, just to con finish on this point of the relationship between European societies and the EU with uh, Russia and the Russians, then of course there is the second relationship, which is the relationship with the 140 million inhabitants of Russia with uh, um, economic agents there, uh, enterprises, with uh, uh, municipalities, with associations. Uh, 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 and, and that used to be quite rich and constructive. And of course, you know, in the last 15 years, the regime has done everything to make those relations almost impossible. And of course, uh, in, in, in recent months even, we see that m uh, many uh, organizations, uh, Western organizations, are now considered to be undesirable mm. organizations in Russia. Yes. So this dialogue between Western uh, NGOs and Russian NGOs, it's shrinking every, every, every month. Probably. You can even be an undesirable if you're abroad. <laughs> oh, exactly. It's fantastic. You can be an undesirable... Uh, organization or you can be an undesirable person you can be a foreign agent a foreign agent for a foreign agent you can be uh, uh, even a person can be a foreign agent exactly. or an organization so uh, we, we now uh, it, it's everything is surrealistic uh, in Russia but dangerous of course it's not a film uh, and this is what we have to fight against and we have the right to do so and those who pretend in our countries that it, it is a, a, a non-respect of the sovereignty of domestic affairs in Russia or and this is totally ridiculous this just makes absolutely no sense and once again that is never said in the EU uh, institutions because we don't react in terms of sovereignty, sovereign state. This is what the EU is about, is that it's better than national sovereignty. I think there is uh, a, a new report uh, that was adopted in, in yes. September. It did mention that it, there is a need to work with the Russian society, with the Russian civil society. Sure, sure. And there is a clear mm. distinction between the regime and the people. I think this is very important. But uh, one remark about Belarus is that actually the EU does not recognize the legitimacy of, the, of Lukashenko's presidency. So uh, the reference to him would be, you know, self-declared president of, of Belarus. And what's, uh, you mentioned these you know, financial and industrial interests of the EU when dealing with Russia. But actually, um, it may seem that the sanctions against Belarus, they are safe in comparison to, say, to the sanctions against Russia. Because there, are, there, there isn't much uh, business relationship with Belarus. So the EU does not really suffer from any economic drawbacks uh, that it, it does suffer from the sanctions against Russia. So it's, it's really safe to, to, to introduce uh, even you know, the, the worst sanctions against Belarus. I, I would not quite define the problem in, 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 in such words. Um, the, of course, when we all went, all democracies went for targeted sanctions in uh, uh, in, in 2014, um, 
uh, Putin went for counter sanctions. And yes, they did hurt. I remember especially uh, Finland and a few close neighbors um, that um, do a lot of trade uh, with, uh, with Russia besides oil and gas. This is important besides raw uh, material. Uh, but quickly, this waned in a way. Marie, my last question would be about the expertise. You're a scholar, you're an academic. Mm -hmm. um, some would say that during the Cold War, uh, politicians had more expertise about the Soviet Russia. Now, uh, people would say that we are lacking this, uh, this expertise and probably what's more important, in the Cold War there was a coherent relationship between the academic expertise, um, scholarly expertise, research uh, expertise about uh, about Soviet Russia in comparison to what we have now about uh, about uh, about Putin's Russia. Do you think that there is this lack of expertise? Well, I I think from a Europeans uh, from a European point of view, um, this is not quite the way. The Cold War functioned. I think uh, what you described is more the American paradigm, clearly. And I was a grad student in the US during the Cold War, and uh, I remember you had a much closer relationship and politically correct position among academics, especially in Washington DC, and um, who were very closely linked to think tanks and to um, the administration. And, and, and the United States is very far away from Moscow. Uh, the Cold War, the division of Europe in two, was lived very differently by the Europeans on each side on both sides of the wall. Uh, uh, so uh, there, were, there were very different positions. If we take France, very different positions uh, among the political uh, class, and among scholars, among journalists, and in public opinion about um, Soviet, the Soviet life, about the Soviet regime, about this is very different, you know, in, in, in the, uh, still in the 1950s, early 60s, we had a strong communist party very close to Moscow. Italy was even uh, worse, probably. And so, so um, no, during those years, first, it was very difficult to get good, relevant, honest expertise. If there was a consensus, it was in the US because there was virtually not much space for, um, you know, criticism of uh, of the uh, uh, executive policy or uh, votes in, in, in Congress. Um, and most of the expertise also came from the CIA, other institutions that had people on the ground in um, the Soviet Union. And we now know that many of the CIA reports were maybe not that accurate about, for example, East Germany or other um, economic and, and social uh, issues. Today is an incredible paradox, which is that those countries, the former 15 republics of the Soviet Union, became independent and relatively free. 30 years ago, 30 years ago. And now there is a, such a regression in Russia and in a number of other republics uh, that we do not have sufficient uh, honest um, evidence about what's going on in that country. The Kremlin, again, is a black box. Now, I never thought that I would go back to my old sovietological methods uh, to try and understand what those men behind closed doors, how they are making their decisions. Uh, so um, the problem with expertise is the banal problem that everyone has, scholar or journalist or politician, diplomat, in an autocratic country where, where uh, media are repressed and dissidents are repressed. Because then we have to rely a lot on what exiled 
um, can tell us and uh, on exiled um, uh, media uh, and, 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 it, and it, is, it is complicated, it is complicated. I, I think where uh, Vladimir Putin is helping us now is that he's going so far in uh, this um, uh, repression of everything. It's not only repression of free voices, it is repression of um, economic uh, uh, actors, repression of uh, free business, repression of um, information. In a man who bans information in the society and in the administration inevitably becomes a disinformed leader. And that's what we're dealing with. So it is good news in the sense that um, the Kremlin will be making more and more mistakes and will become more and more disliked uh, inside and outside uh, Russia. Uh, but um, it is bad news because declining leaderships uh, that go for a besieged fortress um, mentality and propaganda, they can act erratically. And this is <laughs> where we are, I think, in Europe. You know, we are seeing those two trends in a way, and we are walking, uh, you know, uh, a very tight line. Thank you for this conversation, Marie. Thank you, Anton. Mm -hmm.